gentleman who is going to act as moderator next is one of our oldest friends, one of the most regular attendants at our rally, and one of the biggest boosters of it outside the rally. And uh, it's always a pleasure to welcome him back. He's a very distinguished person in his own right, as you all know, or will at least do when you hear his name, because he is one of the few publishers in America who has had the courage of his convictions. And he has published a great many things which other publishers wouldn't touch. And uh, unhappily, a great many things that he has published that have been picked up by other publishers for republishing in paperback have uh, had the unhappy experience of having extra copies of those books destroyed by the people who took over the business. And so many of Devin's books have gone out of print through no fault of his own, but simply because of the continuing attack on people like Devin who have had the courage of, his, of their convictions. And so I know that you have heard him speak and uh, that you, many of you know him personally. And he really needs no introduction, but I do like every once in a while to give somebody who is well known another pat on the back and say how much he's appreciated by some of the rest of us. So this is Mr. Devin Garrity of Devin Adair. Thank you very much, Colonel Bunker. This is the uh, ninth rally I think I've attended. The only one I missed was the one at the time of the assassination. The, um, it's been my pleasure to introduce a number of people on these occasions. Tonight perhaps is the most difficult one. I have introduced Bob Jones, the Bob Jones University. I'm sorry he's not here. Extraordinary man. I've introduced John Stormer, the author of the uh, book None Dare Call It Treason. I keep uh, missing him. I wish he were here. And Ezra Taft Benson. That was one of my great opportunities to introduce a marvelous man, one of the apostles of the Mormon Church. Again, an extraordinary man. And on two occasions, I've had the great opportunity to introduce that wielder of the stiletto pen, as I call him, and that special friend of the Kennedy family, Tom Anderson. Uh, Tom is not here tonight, at least I haven't seen him, but we're going to hear him before the rally's over, and that is always something to look forward to. The, um, as I say, the task I have tonight to introduce um, a genius, because that is exactly uh, the nature of the person that I'm about to introduce, is very difficult, because all geniuses make their own rules. They are not necessarily uh, beholden to uh, the ordinary ways, and uh, one doesn't question their, their um, attitudes to life and their, uh, their methods of handling things. And I think that it's fortunate that the genius we have with us tonight is on our side. And, uh, is a woman of uh, great parts. I have the distinct honor of publishing a book of hers called On Growing Up Tough. And uh, we have copies out there at our little table, and they're autographed. And I think if you don't have one and don't want to read one, uh, certainly you ought to give it to some young person who's in school or college to show you what growing up tough means and has meant. When America consisted of people who had grown up tough we became a great nation. And alas, I think we're declining as people are being brought up soft. And uh, that, I think, characterizes so many of our youth today. When they want to buy a bicycle or a motorcycle, they merely have to get a job for a short time. And at the going rate of $3, $4, $5 an hour, they shortly have their motorcycle. If they had to do it at the basis of 50 cents an hour, it'd take a little longer. At any rate, the woman I'm going to introduce is one of the world's great writers, as we all know. It's redundant to bring it up. And if at times she is a little on the bitter side, it's because 
of the way the liberal press handles her books. Very often they don't review them at all, and if they do, uh, they do it in a rather disgusting manner, and I'd like to just quote a little bit from the New York Times review by Martin Levin of her last book, the book on the called The Captains and the Kings, which uh, may or may not have reference to a certain Massachusetts family. Um, at any rate, here's a book that at the very time was heading to the top of the bestseller list on the Times' own list. And um, their review of it, for those of you who have read it, you can excuse my reading it again, but they, he starts off by saying, secret secrets, they grow like fungi in Taylor Caldwell's jungle of a novel. Now, there are a couple of nasty words to start with, a jungle of a novel. They go down and say this murky family history, murky family history, which begins when Joseph Francis Xavier Arma, an immigrant and so forth, uh, goes to Titusville, PA, and gets rich. Joseph multiplies his inheritance astronomically until he becomes a member of the, quote, invisible government, end quote, that secretly manipulates global politics, said in all irony. Ms. Caldwell's ladies, appropriately, have decided ornithological bent. They can fling themselves, quote, laughing and trilling into someone's arms. And in extremis, one utters a last sound. This is, quote, a fragile cry, like a bird. Yes, there is something here for the birds. That is the review by Martin Levin in the New York Times, which is the world's number one book review media, about a novelist who's perhaps the most widely selling in the whole wide world, translated into language after language, and whose book at that very instant was third on the bestseller list heading up. So I say that it's no wonder that um, she occasionally becomes uh, slightly annoyed at this sort of treatment, because it is, um, it's tough, it's tough to take it. The um, story of her life is a very interesting one, and I'm only going to read a few paragraphs here from something that she wrote about herself by way of autobiography. And it has a special reference to those of you who may want to write. Because writing is not, there are so many people that come up to me at Devon Adair stand and say, you know, I want to write a book, or you know, I've written a book, or you know, I'm halfway through a book. And they haven't the slightest idea that writing a book is, is, a, is a discipline, it is hard, it takes a lot of work in addition to sort of a vague dream of saying something. She says here, I was born in a suburb of Manchester, England, of Scots-Irish ancestry. My father was staff artist of the Manchester Guardian, and I brought his family to the United States when I was six years old. Six years old, she brought her family. I was a yeoman in the U.S. Naval Reserve when I reached my 18th birthday, just before the end of World War I, and later worked as court reporter for the State Labor Department in Buffalo, and then with the, the Department of Justice. By the time we were six years old, we students had had two years of Latin and one of French, and had gone far beyond Dick and Jane and Spot. I wrote plays and musical scores and sketches and poems for my Sunday school class. I wrote novels beginning when I was nine, and when I was 12, my father sent a large, completed novel to my grandfather in Philadelphia, who was on the staff of a large publishing house. My grandfather could not believe a child could have written such a novel and said I must have copied it. And I still have that old manuscript about Atlantis, in which I wrote about the nuclear bomb. That was in 1913. I write at night, first because nights are far more beautiful than days, and I feel alive at night being a night person. Moreover, there are no interruptions at night, no telephones, no doorbells. I avoid these by sleeping during the day. <laughs> when I start to write, I do not stop until I have completely exhausted what I had in mind for that night. Sometimes it goes on from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Then I have to wait until another idea occurs to me from out of my subconscious. Sometimes that idea comes within four or five hours, and sometimes not for four or five weeks. And at one time, I had to put aside a book for three years 
before the well filled up again. If anyone is interested, I have been a mother since I was 18, a grandmother since I was 39, a great-grandmother since I was 59, or a little younger. I have three great-grandchildren, and it seems to me they are an improvement over my children and grandchildren. Of course, that may be only prejudice. I don't like dogmatic or enthusiastic people, or optimistic ones, no matter what their age. I'm also wary of people who have profound and unshakable convictions. When I am asked why I don't like optimistic people, I answer, I have seen too many calamities they have produced, especially in international affairs. In politics, I lean to the conservative. In thought and action, I trend to the unconventional, and sometimes the reverse. And I vote for the man and not the party. Despite the fact that she says that it's impossible for a woman to be a genius, that men are the geniuses, and that behind every so-called woman genius is always a man, I would like to introduce you to person I consider to be a genuine genius, Taylor Caldwell. Times. A little bit on the bitter side. The party. Despite the fact that she says that it's impossible for a woman to be a genius, that men are the geniuses, and that behind every so-called woman genius is always a man, I would like to introduce you to a person I consider to be a genuine genius, Taylor Caldwell. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I feel a little put on tonight because well, the last time I spoke in the Madison Square Garden before 25,000 people, I was heavily picketed by at least five different communist organizations. When I spoke in Phoenix, I was picketed by two communist organizations. Nobody picketed me tonight. <laughs> uh, two weeks ago today, I was married to a southern gentleman who comes from an old Confederate family. I don't know if he's here or not. Is he here? Is he here? <laughs> Would the real Mr. Stansell please stand up? Is he? Is he? I think he's scared to death. <laughs> well, I am no, uh, I'm no speech maker. I have to mostly read what I have to say. So I hope you won't be too bored to death. And I, and I hope you don't feel as nervous as I do. Uh, the title of this alleged speech is, For What Avail? Only few times in the history of man has there truly arisen the exultant cry, I bring you tidings of great joy, of liberty, of hope. The first time, I believe, was when, when Moses exalted his people, proclaim liberty <laughs> throughout the land, and not to the inhabitants thereof. He also had added a remark which no doubt inflames the liberals to this day. <clears throat> Let no nation intrude upon another nation, nor a people upon another people. But let them be separate and apart within their own boundaries, lest I be afflicted. That's from Deuteronomy. In parentheses, I may remark that if this had been followed throughout the history of man, there would have been no wars, no slavery, no exploitation of weaker peoples, no terrors and battlefields, and no fields of the quiet dead. We all know the second time when the tidings of great joy came again to man on the night that Christ was born. And the third time when it was proclaimed from Philadelphia by Benjamin Franklin, we have a republic. He later remarked, if you can keep it. We have, alas, seen that America is no longer a republic. 
we have a degenerate democracy. And we all know that democracies decline into despotism. In fact, each day in Washington, the bureaucracy inflicts another despotic edict against a supine, weak, docile, meek, and frightened America. Several years ago, I spoke in Phoenix, Arizona in a very pessimistic tone about the future of America. Mr. Robert Welsh, you men are always so damned optimistic in the face of terrible and manifest facts, disagreed with me and said in a short speech and in a reprise in American opinion that it, he had every hope for America. Though he did add, I believe, if the American people could be aroused. Unfortunately, they have not been aroused. Or I'm afraid it is entirely too late, even if the majority were aroused. The poison of despotism, liberalism, socialism, and communism has seeped into the very souls of America. I will not go so far as to say that all is entirely lost, and there is no hope. <clears throat> Miracles have been known to happen by the grace of God. But I've noticed that the will to live in its widest sense and the will to free power and liberty <clears throat> have drastically declined in our country since I spoke in Phoenix. Sober and intelligent patriots are now inclined to agree with me. And the men among them hope for America. As a woman, I am pragmatic, and I don't believe you can burn ashes. And the ashes of liberty and manly pride are strewn over the cities and countryside of America. And it was um, you Americans, you and I, who did that. I need only to point out the fact that when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by a demented actor, horrible reprisals were taken on an innocent South, and the whole country was in flames. When President Kennedy was assassinated by a communist, the national press and TV and radio commentators rushed in to say the communist was only a Marxist, a loner, a man who had had strict toilet training as a child, whose father had deserted him cruelly by dying in the murderous childhood, that he had a dominant mother, poor thing, poor thing. The fact that that man has spent a number of years in Russia, had been trained as a political assassin in Russia, had married the niece of a man who was a member of the frightful Russian secret police, had tried to become a Russian citizen, had distributed pamphlets on the streets of New Orleans and other cities in behalf of Castro, had books in his room on communism, and was an avowed communist, was suppressed after the first blurting out. But millions knew of this before something or someone, someone suppressed it and touched every mommy's heart with stories of parental re uh, desertion and early toilet training. I heard that five times on TV. Mommy lives by Dr. Spock in these United States. Uh, most mommies do, unfortunately. And what mommy says in America, alas, usually is impressed on daddy-o. And aside to you gentlemen in the audience, you better take over your country from the women and forbid mommy to read Dr. Spock. Your, or your country is not only lost, but it'll never be recovered. And every whiner, every, hate, every hater of liberty, every mendicant in this afflicted country will take over. You'll know by this remark I'm not a member of Women's Lib. I'd like to remark in, about this. And I'd like to remark on this occasion. I've been on TV many, many times. I know how long it takes to set up the apparatus. I know how long, even if you live within 15 minutes drive of the TV station, it takes at least two solid hours before it's set up for somebody to speak. I've been there too often not to know. Yet Earl Warren, and uh, when he's dead, may he not rest in peace. 
he was on TV within half an hour after President Kennedy was shot. How did he get there? Why was he in the station? Do you know something? He probably did. And that so-and-so looked into the TV camera and said, some right winger did this. And he looked ominously and with blood in his eye at the audience. When he later learned that it was a communist who did it, he put his little hand on his bosom and said, I'm shot, I'm shot. So now you see what we're up against in America. To come back to political assassinations, we don't have to ask why the public means of communication su succeed in, in toning down the fact that Oswald was a communist. We are all sophisticated about the matter of the coup that happened and where it is really plotted. And we know that Oswald was only an instrument of the conspiracy against America. The president's brother, a few years later, was murdered by an open and avowed communist. And again, the public means of communication rushed in to suppress the fact, or at least to minimize it. Siran Siran, as we know, was not a loner as the press shrieked he was, and the liberals howled he was. He too, like Oswald, was only the instrument that pulled the trigger. Now we have another example of the coup d'etat, the attempted assassination of Governor Wallace. The instrument this time is alleged to be a loner too. It's funny about these loners, isn't it? And rather feeble-minded. Perhaps he is. But whose instructions were behind the attempted murder? Was the governor getting too close to the nomination for the presidency of the Democratic Party? Who were the faceless men who had decided he was an awesome danger to them and that his nomination might conceivably have resulted in his election? And that if he were elected, he might desperately struggle against our liberal socialistic communist masters and might possibly have reversed the tide. Certainly for the other contend contenders for the nomination were good and innocent men, or at least innocent of any plot against other Democratic contenders. The signal for his attempted murder probably came from Zurich, from the norms of Zurich, as President Kennedy called them. Our masters, who were permitted to become our rulers, to put over in us the federal reserve system, the federal income tax, and wars and socialism and the death of our liberty. They were permitted to do all this and to increase and enlarge their plots against us by the weak, soft, greedy will of the American people. And so the American people, and not even their government, in the early days of this century are the true criminals against not only themselves but against their neighbors. I recommend for skeptics the new paperback by Gary Allen, None Dare Call It Conspiracy, but I know it is a conspiracy, and I, I think you do too. We have a habit among us patriots of attributing to outside forces, such as Russia and mail, of attempting to destroy America by subversion from within and without. But has anyone stopped to think that America is one of the biggest subversive nations in the world and that she has brought disaster in the name of liberalism and welfareism to other countries? Does it ever occur to the average American that his own nation is as powerful in communist socialist subversion within and without as Russia and Red China and probably even more so? When I was in Hong Kong recently, less than two years ago, a government official told me, it may surprise you that there are three Soviet empires in the world today, Soviet Russia, Red China, and the United States of America. But he was surprised when he discovered I was not in the least surprised. I will give you one instance I know of personally, among many. Some years ago, not too long ago, I was in Uruguay in Montevideo. I was on a cruise. Washington learned of this, and so I was cabled by our ambassador in Montevideo 
to ask me if I would make a speech there when I arrived in the embassy. At that time, I was a little less informed than I am now, and so I consented and prepared the speech on shipboard. I was met in Montevideo by a very large group of fanatical zealots of socialism and welfareism, all American bureaucrats. They conducted me en masse to my hotel, and there with drinks they surrounded me eagerly with pencils and notebooks. As I am a novelist, they assumed I was a liberal traitor just like themselves, and burning with socialistic fervor. For I am sorry to say that most American writers are liberal socialistic traitors. They wanted to know what that's true. I, I know them. They wanted to know what I was going to talk about. I told them I was going to talk about the plot against liberty all over the world and a man's right to the freedom of living as a man, unhampered by bureaucrats, do good as bleeding hearts, and plot us against liberty. A sudden icy silence fell over the male and female American zealots, and they peeked at each other furtively. Then one lady bureaucrat met her, wet her mealy lips and said, but don't you think it's wonderful, Miss Caldwell, that we Americans in Uruguay are teaching the people democracy? I bluntly replied, why is it your business what sort of government other nations have? And why should you interfere with the will of these nations? And why should you try to subvert and destroy, yes, I say destroy, any other country with our crippling and dangerous and subversive democracy. Is that what we have in America so marvelous, so free, so noble, so manly, so glorious, so open to the splendors of liberty and the will of free men that we should even dare, and I say it is the most monstrous of impudences, to try to impose it on other people? What is your purpose, may I ask? What are you really trying to do? You see, in those earlier days, I was not so quite well informed as I am now about our subversive country and what America is not only doing here, but what she's trying to do in others and, alas, eminently succeeding. Let me read you some remarks in an article published a few weeks ago in the Chicago Daily News Services concerning Uruguay, who was completely corrupted and destroyed by the United States of America. You will note there is no mention in this article of the American assassins of liberty resident in Uruguay to this day and working under their bureaucracy in Washington and directed by men in the highest echelons of our government. There is no mention of what America has done to that once booming, free, proud, and manly little country, and how she destroyed it and reduced it to penury, despair, and bankruptcy, and imposed socialism on it. But what America has done in Uruguay, and all over South America, and in other countries throughout the world, should be exposed, I hope, to the horrified American people who can read that fast approaching doom in the history of Uruguay over the past 15 years. Now, I will quote from that, th those articles of a few weeks ago in the Chicago Daily News Services. Quote, These are, this is said by uh, people who live in Uruguay. However it started, or by whom, is not an exaggeration to say to say that Montevideo and thus Uruguay is slowly dying. It is dying of a slow rot of the spirit. I repeat that deadly and informed remark. It is dying of a slow rot of the spirit. And I may remark here that America too, for the very same reasons, is dying of a slow rot of the spirit. We see it everywhere. The diplomat, that went on to remark, quote, it is like living at a wake. Indeed, indeed. And there is a wake-like atmosphere in America today, though the corpse is not quite dead as yet, 
but surely died. The article continues, and I quote it verbatim. Now, this, this is from the Uruguayan Press. Montevideo, once one of the most beautiful cities in the world, has a feeling of slow death creeping about the darkened street. Its once charming, crenellated, curlicued buildings are crumbling from lack of care as constant strikes paralyze the country. Advice only with New York and the amount of trash and garbage littering its once proud streets. The telephones don't work, the airlines don't work, the telegraph doesn't work, the slaughterhouses don't work. People are having difficulty in finding things to eat. We have eight million cows and several million sheep, and we have nothing to eat. If our will does not return to Uruguay, it, uh, our will to survive does not return to Uruguay, we should, our country will surely die. It is dying now. It's agonizing. End of quote. This article, by the way, quoted Dr. Carlos Quiano, director of the successful leftist movement in Uruguay. He wails. He never looks in his mirror to see the assassin of liberty confronting him and probably doesn't even think of the American sub subversive bureaucrat who brought this on his country. Now, does he glance towards Washington and say, I accuse? No, indeed, for he collaborated with America, the enemy of his country. Now, the article continues in quotes, but the worst thing is not the physical, but the spiritual decay. The country seems caught up in a paralytic seizure of the spirit. The people are sunk in lethargy. The newspaper, El Pais, put it even more strongly. We are an aging people. We are quiescent. We are timorous. We don't educate ourselves well in politics. We don't work well. Our population is dwindling. About 32,000 Uruguayans emigrate each year, and, they, and these are the most ambitious and industrious people. End of quote. Now the article goes on. The problem in Uruguay is an overstaffed national bureaucracy. 25% of all employees work for the government, and 15% are on pensions. Too many social workers and too many benefits and 22 largely broken down public corporations depending on 20% of the people who are willing to work and work in agriculture and industry. From 1955 to 1961, the gross national product of Uruguay grew at a rate of less than 1% a year. And from 1965 to 1970, it decreased at an annual rate of less than 1%. Meanwhile, inflation is booming at the rate of 66 to 100 percent a year. The trend is steadily downward. The latest budget ended in a 25 percent deficit. Now, still quoting from uh, El Pais, one of the problems of the country is that it's a, a democracy of receiving and taking by the people, and not a republic of giving and producing. The selfishness is not paying off, nor is the welfare is. I'm still quoting from the, the, news, the uh, your grand newspaper. One economist said, our people do not realize yet how bad a shape Uruguay is in. Look at Uruguay, fellow Americans. Look closely at the reason for her decline and her death as a nation. The exact same d disease which killed that once beautiful free little country is killing America. I happen to know that at various times, the sleeping Uruguayan people awoke and tried to revolt. But their chains, their own willed chains, offered to them by American subversives, grew heavier and more restrictive. So they died in the prison of their own criminal making. Uruguay is a picture in miniature of what is happening to us. And her death will be our death, and in the near future, too. Unless, but alas. Uruguay wasn't the only nation, nor personally, 
that was destroyed by Washington, by an Amer American bureaucrat. I happened to be British born, and I saw what American bureaucrats were doing to the, the British Commonwealth, to the British Empire, which was the balance wheel in the world. They destroyed my country with their communism and socialism. It was America from Washington who introduced that to, in, into my country. Then the liberals, and especially in the New York Times, began to scream, we have now reduced the British Empire to a happy little country. Any of you who've seen England recently would not agree she is a dead country. Oh, what happened to my estimate, optimistic plan to speak in Montevideo? The next day, the American ambassador called me up with his regrets and said that though he was giving me a huge cocktail party in the embassy the next night, he regretted to say that some thousands of the people who were attending that party had to go somewhere else. He implied that there had been too little time to make arrangements for my speech. He had only had six weeks. I went doggedly to the party, though my husband angrily refused to do so. And there I met the sneaky, vicious, little American subversive zealots, who looked at me sideways and smirked in triumph. Then I became enraged. I'm a fighter, you know. I, I, I don't put my finger in my mouth and smirk modestly. Every time a resident American or a native of Uruguay or a diplomat of other nations expressed his regrets that I had declined to speak, I blurted out in a loud, clear voice which reached through every immense and gilded room. Whoever told you that is a liar of the worst and most subversive type. I wanted to speak for liberty and how a nation will die if deprived of it. And the gentleman from America, our ambassador, said you people didn't have time to listen. A deep hush fell over the drinking and chatting people. And I moved from room to room and repeated my blunt and sometimes profane <laughs> remarks. And finally, people spaced <laughs> Finally, people's faces darkened, and they shook my hand, and they left without saying goodnight to the ambassador. He stood with his little Austrian wife at his side and could not look me in the eye when I announced my departure. His face was moist with sweat. The bureaucrats who had followed me stood like a pack of wolves in the background, American bureaucrat, and they peeped at each other and licked, the, uh, licked their lips. They knew what they had done, and they knew what they were doing to that country. Unfortunately, they have exceeded too often and too well in other doomed nations, just as they are succeeding within our own borders. They did not do it by themselves, nor hatch the plot by themselves. They were only obeying directives from Washington. It is a power race, open and revealed now between the three Soviet empires, Russia, the United States, and Red China. It is a race to see which Sovietism will control the helpless people in the world and which will enslave them. But we are not some little Latin countries, many people have said to me. We are a great big nation. It can't happen here. It happened in huge China. It happened in Russia, far faster than the United States. It is happening here at this very moment. We have sold our birthright, truly, for a mess of pottage. We have sold our liberty for security. We have acted as traitors against the men who gave us a free nation by demanding what our government calls services and benefits. We are a dying nation. The big government checks we are receiving, or which we hope to receive, from the pockets of those few still manly Americans who are having their earned money taken from them in taxes, 
are the sign, sign and sealed mark of the beast of our slavery and our death. We love and admire Collective Peter and hate and persecute Industrious Paul, who tries to protest against the robbery in taxes to support mendicants and to pay for our undeclared wars, our, our wars we refuse to win. We call him greedy for wanting to save some of his earnings and accuse him of lacking compassion when he demands that other people work as he works. Can anything reverse all this? I don't think so. The situation has become more disastrous than it was five or six years ago, and it's daily becoming more disastrous. I fear we are doomed. I've been asked by some friends here tonight to try to inject a little hope into this speech. In fact, I hate the word hope. It's used by the criminals, the criminal communists and liberals who say hopefully this, and we hope. Now, I don't believe in hope when hope is practically dead. I'm a Bible student, and I often think how Abraham tried to bargain with God for the saving from destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. God kindly listened to his prayers and then suggested that if Abraham could find, I think, about 100 just men in those towns, he would not smite the cities. But Abraham could not find 100 just men. He continued to pray and the bargaining went down to 50, then to 20, then to 10, and in every instance, Abraham could not find upon find the agreed upon number. So the cities of the plain were destroyed by fire and fury. Now perhaps in America there may be a number of just men who can plead with God for the salvation of America. Though I doubt they know that no nation ever approached this abyss as closely as America and turned back from it. Still America's history is unique and there may be a possibility that her salvation will be unique among nations. I have observed lately that American conservatives seem to be growing in number, or perhaps they're only protesting for the first time in our history, and so that makes them more noticeable. At least they're becoming alarmed enough to raise their timid little voices as their enemies are always shrieking. We can strike at the root of all evil in this country. The federal income tax, which has not only financed all the wars of this century, but is financing communism in the name of welfare, child development, and God only knows what else. Deprive government of its power and terrorism through the income tax, and, and is the only way back to sanity. Except for defense, and defense only, and you've cut off his murderous tentacles. Return the power to tax only to the states for roads, police, firemen, sane and sensible schools, water, street cleaning, and a few other essentials, and put the beggars to work, and our freedoms will be automatically restored. The power... That's it. As Lord Acton said, the power to tax is the power to destroy. As we all know the old aphorism, which destroyed great nations and reduced them to rubble and the rule of barbarians. And I might remind everyone of the ancient Chinese saying, government is always the enemy of the people and as audacious as a tiger. Government takes its power from the pockets of its citizens. It has no other source of power. Through its confiscation of the people's money, it can hire criminals to enslave the people. Thousands of other patriots have advocated and are advocating the repeal of the federal income tax. And the only result has been assaults on them by the Internal Revenue Service, harassments, cruelties, despairs, and more confiscations as punishment. I know, I went through it for four years. 
The American people feebly complain of robbery at the hands of their government, but they are fearful of bodily confronting that government and shouting, that shall not steal. And they never come. And they never, but never, come to the aid of victims who have been tortured and tormented and imprisoned by the Internal Revenue Service. You can commit murder and get up with two to 20 years and have all the social workers climbing in your trousers with you. But, but you try to keep back $100 of your hard-earned money and you go to prison for endless years. That's our government. St. Paul cried to the people, he who does not work, neither shall he eat. What if we demanded of our alleged government that it observe the Constitution, notably that clause which says only Congress has the power to declare war, and that undeclared and unwon wars are unconstitutional? Could the government murder or imprison or torment 20 or 30 million of us who might inspire feebler spirits. I doubt it, but I do not doubt that it would try. Still may I manage that. The reduction of power of government is our only hope for national survival and the return of our liberty. It has always been the hope of past dead nations, but not one cleaned out the government cesspool, and so they drowned in it as we shall soon drown. Let us raise up stronger manly men if we can find them now. And let us remember what Emerson said. For what avail the plow and sail, the land or life, if freedom fail? Yes, indeed, for what avail if we permit Big Mommy to dominate our government and feed us her poisonous socialistic porridge until we ever die of it or reduced to robots. We have one hope, the end of absolute power of government through the only means possible. Let us ponder at it and think what to do. It's a feeble hope, but it commits real men and real women to a battle worthy of real Americans. Our situation is much like that of Ulysses and Tennyson's great poem, which concludes, Though much is taken, much abides, and though we are not now that strength which in the old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Thank you.